Hello, Houston. We've been uh, discussing maps, and we're going to uh, look at one last segment here, I believe, um, looking specifically at how do we measure cognitive maps. That turns out to be a rather interesting task. And I'm going to uh, start with a list. We're just going to review quickly where we were last time as we got into this, asking about how we measure cognitive maps. And in essence, there are at least five different answers I can give to you. One is the idea that we simply rely on verbal recall. The difficulty with that is that it confounds linguistic ability uh, and spatial knowledge. It also uh, suggests that uh, it's, it's a here-there kind of situation because environmental experiences are simultaneous. Everything is happening around you when you're in a map anywhere, and yet the, the instructions we give are serial. So another possibility is, well, okay, let's just give people a, a sketch pad, a paper, and a pen. And, and the difficulty there is that it confounds cognitive mapping or ability with our externalizing ability, that is our ability to kind of position ourselves anywhere in a map and understand and produce symbols that will really convey where we are in a map. The translation from large scale, the real environment, to small scale can become a problem when we try to do it on, on the, on the uh, paper. So the third possibility is, well, okay, let's have a child reconstruct a model of a space in which he or she may be familiar, with which they may be familiar. That eliminates confounding verbal ability and drawing skill with what's recalled, but the representation, that is knowing that a model stands for something else, really is, is dependent on our ability to, to do this. And we've also got translation problems of scale that still remain in this situation. Uh, for instance, in, in this particular model, um, this was the classroom that kids were actually taught in. It's a, it's a, and kindergartners were asked to build a model of their classroom near the end of a, of a nine month school year. So they had had plenty of time to learn what was where in their classroom. And the results were kind of impressive. David, no problem. He could nail each seat where it was and, and had no trouble at all. But Buffy, on the other hand, built the model this way, okay? And yet Siegel, who conducted this experiment, noted that, that neither of these two children were ever seen bumping into each other or walls in the classroom. They could do it. I mean, they could navigate around the classroom, but it was clear that how to communicate that to the rest of the world was not a skill that happened to be on Buffy's uh, list of, of uh, skills. So another possibility is, okay, let's don't do small scale. Let's instead reconstruct a large scale spatial layout and walk the children through, in this case, a, a 16 by 20 model village that remove, and then remove the buildings and ask the children to reconstruct it. The problem here is basically non-existent. That is, it eliminates all of the above listed problems that we've talked about, but some others occurred. Binding the space led to, to consistent improvement. Um, unbound space, on the other hand, meant that little kids showed little improvement at all. So whether you do this in an exactly sized room or, or put them in a gym or something makes a significant difference in what we actually find in that situation. It taps memory location, but it doesn't really reach root or configurational knowledge. So the children became increasingly accurate in terms of, of what they were doing. And that led us to one other model, and that was simply pointing and multidimensional scaling. Take a person to three different spaces. Now this one is a little tough to convey, but think about campus here. What I'm going to do is take you out to three different places on campus, for instance, and ask you to point to a landmark. Where's the library? Where's this? Where's that? And then what we do is to use a plot using compass directions to try and triangulate the actual location in your head of where these fixtures actually are. So we take, take you to two different places and I ask you again to point to, to two different models. And this is what we find. The solid line indicates when we're asking you to point to one model and the dotted line asks you to, to point to a different landmark. So the, the two lines indicate what's going on, uh, where you're pointing when asked to, to give directions to either of two different things. And in that case then, here are the landmarks. That was target one. Here was target two when we ask you to point. And the overlap between those three people is where we think the landmark should actually be if you take the best guess of all three models here. Um, not totally accurate, as you might note. So even when you're standing in the environment and asked to point blindly at where a model is or where a particular landmark is, the accuracy is, is not quite so good here. In fact, let's use a real world model. 
This is the actual map, the, the current map that's on the, uh, the uh, website for University of Houston, and it shows everything that's, that's currently existent as of, as of uh, late this last fall. Uh, so it's a reasonably current map. And the question that I would ask you here is just in your own head, think for a minute. From the main plaza at the center of PGH, Philip G. Hoffman Hall, that's the building that you can walk through without actually going in as you're headed into the library. Which is closer from that location, the College of Education or Cougar Place? Now that one's pretty easy, okay? From, from Philip G. Hoffman here, College of Education is here, but Cougar Place is way over here. Now let's toughen it up a little bit. Let's put you on the main entrance on the campus side of the College of Business and ask you which is closer. Cullen College of Engineering, uh, sorry, the main library or the Cullen College of Engineering. In this case, it's a lot closer. That's a tougher judgment without seeing the map, actually. So the combination of these last two techniques has really led to the establishment of the following order in which the elements of a cognitive map are normally established. Okay? And the order of events specifically does the following kind of thing. First of all, you note the landmarks. That is, how do I get from home to my job? For some of us, it's easy. For others, it's trial and error. And it involves a series of point-to-point -point navigations. This is the process of experimentation. The second thing that we tend to do is to learn the routes between the landmarks, and then we scale the routes appropriately. And theoretically, what that will then allow us to do is to integrate a representative map of the environment that we're in. You know, when you move to a new apartment, that's essentially the problem you face. How do I get from there to school? And that's, that's a mapping problem that you've got here. So you, you know where home is, your new apartment. Whoops, what am I doing here? Let's, let's, there we go. You know where home is, you know where the university is, and some way you develop a route to get from one to the other. But then you've got a problem. You go visit a friend's house, and you know that it's way out of, way, way out of your way relative to where the university is. But if you have to go to the university from your friend's house, that's the problem. Do you know the space overall well enough so that you can actually get from the one to the other. That's the ultimate challenge in, in mapping. So let's take that now and put it into the more general category regarding knowledge. Quick review for you in terms of general knowledge, and we're just going to go right through these because you, you know these already. But in essence, I want to just review for you that the, the first model that we looked at actually was the human associative memory model, which was around for a long time. And that was the one that basically processes information in terms of a sensory store, initial input. And if that information is attended to, you input it into short-term storage, which is, of course, activated. And as long as you rehearse it, the information remains available. And as you remember, there are several different possibilities there. You can output it, you can utilize it immediately, or you can, through that rehearsal, put it into long-term memory. So essentially, it's, it's a kind of a length of storage model that is involved. And you'll remember that that was supplanted by the work of Tulving. Tolving's model actually came out with the idea that, that, or the proposal essentially, that we can instead store things in terms of episodic memory, that is, when, where, and what actually occurred in our given life at any, any time. There's always an implied personal referent in this memory. It involves things that have happened in your individual life. Your episodic memory is different from mine, is different from anybody else's. Which in turn then leads us to a second element, which is semantic memory, which we're going to spend more time with today. And that involves storage, stored knowledge without any time referent at all. Can you tell me when you first learned the location of New York City, as an example, relative to Houston? That's somewhere in semantic memory. It involves encyclopedic memory, encyclopedic knowledge. For instance, do you know immediately what the next leap year is going to be? If you've learned that it occurs every four even years, you can simply take this year and figure out, subtract from, from the next uh, year that's evenly divided by 12. It also includes lexical and language knowledge. For instance, what do the University of Houston and a car made for a long time by Mercury have in common? What do the University of Houston and a car made for a long time by Mercury have in common? Cougar. <laughs> A cougar. 
We also have in that same model procedural knowledge, as you'll remember. He initially started simply with episodic and semantic and eventually came to the idea that he also needed to talk about certain other things that are, that are operational, athletic, movement-oriented, knowledge including spatial location, such as we use in navigating around a map. And that, of course, is, is procedural knowledge. That's what today's uh, discussion is going to be largely about in that model, is essentially procedures and features. And we're going to talk about this in terms of one of the traditional models, first of all, and that is a feature comparison or a definitional theory. It's based on the assumption that meaning is actually composed of a set of meaning components. Okay? Meaning components. The components are individually needed to define meaning, but you're going to see that it's not quite that simple. Meaning turns out to be one of the toughest problems that psychologists are trying to, uh, to explain, define. They jointly define a unique meaning for each word once we have enough of those features identified. Um, but each component is essential to the definition of the component of the concept to which they are related. Okay? The listed properties uniquely combine to define the concept. Each component is a defining feature. For instance, think about it for a minute. How do you define a dog? Let's, let's run a list for you here. First of all, we note that a dog has fur. You like that? But what about a Mexican hairless? Still a dog. Doesn't have fur. Well, we know a dog has four legs. Well, what if dog has been in a car accident? Had a dog, a leg had to be amputated. All right. It's got to have a tail. What about a boxer? Still a dog, doesn't have a tail. Doesn't have much fur either, if you think about it normally. Okay, but it likes water. It barks. It chases cats. And we could array a lot of different features there if we wish to. In essence, what we do is we keep adding features until the concept is uniquely defined. If A and B and C, then it's true we finally defined the animal in a satisfactory way. But consider some problems related to that. For instance, consider, and this is sexist, and I apologize for that, I couldn't think of a unisex model or an alter, a multi-sex model when I needed it. Consider the concept of old maid, okay? If we talk about old maid, it is essentially a human and composed of three components. That is, it has to be female, past marrying age, and unmarried. Components are used singly, and thus the absence of even one makes the definition inapplicable to the word. So an unmarried female who is not an adult is not an old maid. A 16-year-old female, for instance, would not qualify. Not an old maid because she's not past marrying age in that case. Not all female adults qualify for that matter. If married, then you're not an old maid. An unmarried male is not an old maid, regardless of his age in that situation. So since all three components are jointly sufficient, if all three components apply, then the definition automatically applies. According to this feature comparison or definitional theory, you cannot be female, past marrying age, and unmarried, and not be an old maid. Then we get into separate discussions about, for instance, what is the most popular model now of divorcees. More than half of the marriages that we get into are going to end up falling apart one way or another. The theory applied much more broadly, of course, um, in, in terms of assembling features. An uncle, for instance, is male. He's in the next older generation than you are. He's got a brother and a sister who has had children, including you. But there are some problems with this overall model of simply listing features to try and define a word. For instance, despite clear defining features, some features may be absent without affecting meaning, as we've simply indicated in, in going through the list and trying to define a dog earlier. But you think, for instance, about a rattlesnake. Even a rattlesnake without its rattle is just as dangerous, just as deadly. So there are some features that, that can be absent and yet not destroy the meaning at all of, of the concept that we're, that we're working with. Even a critical feature, which is rattlesnake, in or the rattle, in defining a rattlesnake. 
And yet we have the, the same feature encountered when we start with, with birds. For instance, a key feature is obviously flying. And a bluebird with a broken wing can't fly, but it's just as clearly still a bird and still a bluebird. Or how about penguins? They can't fly, they're still a bird, given the way we normally define them. Webster's International Dictionary, in fact, starts the definition of penguins in a rather curious way. Any of a variety of flightless marine birds. So it starts the definition of penguin by noting the exception because we're agreed that penguins are still birds. So both bluebirds and penguins share defining features. They are birds. But a bluebird seems to be a better example, more typical somehow, of what we're trying to uh, define in this situation. Barbara Malt and Edward Smith, back in 1984, asked subjects to rate a variety of organisms as to their typicality for birds. That is what we're seeking is, what is a typical bird, given the definition? So on a seven-point scale, we get the following kind of, of details. We certainly have individual exceptions as we've been talking about them. But if we look at typicality ratings, you get a rather curious mix from one to seven, where one is, is the lowest typicality of whatever we're trying to define, in this case, birds. And we find the following. If we look at bird as, as the key, robin has a very high typicality rating. But we get all the way down to bats, which are only 1.53, and yet they fit many of the elements of, of what are involved, although they're, as we know, mammals. Okay? It's a mammal. It's not a bird at all, and yet it can fly. So we have trouble. In summary, if we use feature comparison definitions, the theory has attractive features, but something is missing. Examples that share all of the defining features sometimes seem to be better than others um, that don't. Differential typicality is accounted for by another theory, and that is what was eventually developed is what is referred to as prototype theory. We argued essentially that meaning is derived from characteristic features which describe, by which I mean characterize or typify, the concept that we're trying to define. But the typical, actual prototypic model of the word can be represented by prototypes. So we're going to define a prototype in either of two ways. It can be either an original item which subsequent models are based on, or it can be the item in a set of similar items that best represents the entire collection of items. You can do it either way. A prototype can be defined and utilized either way. So now what we're going to look at then is essentially characteristic features. And we're going to define those as the qualities that describe a prototypic model of a word or a concept, which thus serve as the meaning of the word or the concept. These characteristic features will describe or apply to many or most instances of a word or a concept, but not necessarily to all of them. So that's going to lead us down the path of trying to, to, to indicate what we mean by a defining feature, which is possessed by all members of a concept. Flying would be a good example of birds, but even there we had exceptions. And so what we'll do instead is to qualify it with, well, okay, let's talk about characteristic features, which are sufficient to define a concept, but not necessary to do so. So we're kind of hedging our bet against the importance of flying in this particular situation. Most instances of a concept possess each characteristic feature. For example, flying, as we just indicated, is typical of birds. But it's not a defining feature. An organism can be a bird, but not fly, as we've already discussed. Penguins, ostriches, any bird with a broken wing. So one approach would involve listing the properties of a concept and then count or tally how many actually apply to specific instances of the concept and then calculate a measure of, of family resemblance. That would be another way to kind of narrow in on our concept of, of meaning. Two kinds of concepts using these approaches have actually evolved. One of them is what we call natural concepts. Natural concepts tend to evolve naturally from um, among language users. A fruit, for instance, is any plant that has seeds, pulp, and a skin. But our natural concept of fruit 
does not extend to, and I can give you three very obvious extension or exceptions here. One is tomatoes. It's a South American plant, widely cultivated for its edible, fleshy, usually red, fruit. Because tomato is, in fact, a fruit. Consider, however, pumpkin. It's a coarse, trailing vine that's widely cultivated for its usually orange fruit. Cucumber is a vine cultivated for its usually cylindrical fruit, having a dark green outer covering, as you know, a rind, and white, succulent flesh. But it's considered a fruit. We've also got other kinds of concepts, and those are what we call classical concepts. Okay? In classical concepts, they're readily defined through the defining features. In fact, they're often invented by experts to arbitrarily label a class. Bachelor would be one example. Okay? Natural, fuzzy concepts are constructed around prototypes, which we've been talking about. According to this latter view, an object will be classified as exemplifying a concept if it shares enough features with that concept. So what we're judging essentially here is similarity. Turns out to be quite difficult, as we'll find. We can define it simply as the number of shared features, but others argue the need to weigh some features much more heavily than others. Ross and Spalding in 1994 suggest that we actually define using several different exemplars as alternative representatives of a class. Thus, for instance, a bird might be a robin, but it could also be an eagle or a duck. Those are widely varying examples of what we call a, a bird. So what we're really going to have to do is, is hone significantly on what we're really talking about here in terms, of, in terms of any given concept and how we define its meaning specifically. Eleanor Roche did a really creative series of studies in which she developed essentially two principles that really govern how we use a given concept. One, as she identifies it, is cognitive economy. Okay? By that, what she means is that, that our attempts to balance essentially a desire to maximize the amount of information we have, and thus if we have more categories, we have more active categorization, more accurate categorization. But with as many categories as concepts or events, why bother to have categories? They're really not necessary. So what we try to do then is to minimize the categories to assist in clustering similar world events and concepts together. So it's a very delicate kind of balancing act that we're really running into when we try to define what we mean by the meaning of a given concept. Another element which turns out to be crucial to this overall definition, and we're going to spend a significant amount of time here, is, is labeled by, by Roche perceived world structure. Certain combination of attributes or objects tend to occur more often than other con combinations. For instance, if you have wings, it's likely also to have feathers. But this is an important concept that I want to spend some time on here in terms of what Roche is driving toward in terms of this overall description of a theory of meaning. And that is that this leads to organizing concepts along two different dimensions. Okay, one of them is a vertical dimension, and I'll show you what I mean here by verticality in a minute. And the other is a horizontal dimension. Okay, it emphasizes essentially level of inclusiveness. That's what she's driving toward with this, with this idea of perceived world structure. And she's talking about vertical dimension and horizontal dimensions. Let me give you an example of, of the inclusiveness that she's talking about. Along the verticality dimension, furniture, is more inclusive than chair, which in turn is more inclusive than a phrase like or a concept like high chair or swivel rocker. And what she's done there is essentially to, to refer to the generality of a concept. Okay? And there are three levels that exist in this overall model that she's she's building, and it, it does stand very critical examination. But a superordinate concept Well, let me see if I can get this to advance. There's where I'm headed. So we're still dealing with concepts of prototype, of princi principles of prototype theories. Perceived world objects is, is what I'm looking at, and specifically the vertical dimension. I'm doing some collapsing here to simplify what we're talking about. And so basically in terms of prototype theory, what I want to isolate on and focus on is the vertical dimension specifically. Okay? And in doing that, 
there then turn out to be three different dimensions or levels that are represented. So at the superordinate level, one example would be something like a fruit. That's a superordinate category. All right. Within that, there are some basic elements that we can identify. For instance, apples or peaches or grapes are examples of fruits. They're exemplars of fruits. And in terms of subordinate categories within each of those elements, we can pick out things like among apples, we've got delicious, we've got Macintosh, we've got Granny Smith. I mean, you can go on and on with subordinate categories of fruits. Peaches, same way. We've got clingstone and free, which is, which is the major division among peaches. And among grapes, we can talk about conquered grapes, green grapes, red grapes, and so forth and so on. So concepts at the subordinate level tend to share more features in common than do those at the superordinate level. Okay? So in essence, delicious and Macintosh apples still have several features in common. They look a lot like Granny Smith apples, except Granny Smith have one major exception. That is, those have green skin, as opposed to red, which most of the other ones that we can mention do. So in essence, in order to categorize something at a subordinate level, you need to have some degree of agreement on the features that put something into that particular subordinate category. Concepts at the subordinate level share more common movements when subjects describe body movement when interacting with the concept than do those at, at the superordinate level. I can give you a couple of other examples here. Furniture has certain basic types that are available to us. Tables, lamps, and chairs being three major categories among, among furniture. And yet among each of those we can divide them further into subordinates, as you can see. And a third example involves, for instance, vehicle, which is a generic label at the most su superordinate level. And we can categorize that into cars, buses, and trucks. And again, for each of those, we can identify specific subordinate examples of each of those. So the, the overall vertical dimension that, that uh, Roche has developed does seem to hold up pretty well. For instance, what movement can you describe for a vehicle? Well, it's going to move in some direction, typically close to the ground. But on the other hand, not as much as you can tell me about, for instance, roller skates or bicycles, which are very specific examples of vehicle as the most superordinate uh, category. Okay? So in essence, children name basic exemplars accurately before they can name superordinates. So children move from right to left in their learning. They grow from specific examples to more generic categories like basic levels and then eventually to superordinates so that they can eventually share or identify the things that cars, buses, and trucks share in common. Wheels, movement, and so forth and so on. But kids tend to move from the right to the left in terms of this vertical organization. Palmer, for instance, asked musicians and non-musicians to list the attributes uh, they could think of for instruments like, for instance, a flute or a violin or a trumpet or a piano or a drum. And they find that musicians can do a great job of, of naming more distinctive features of each of those individual instruments. So basically, as we can be, become an expert, our perception of the properties of individual objects sometimes becomes much more refined with experience. We can nail specific features of a violin if we're a violinist, a musician, much more accurately than you and I could with only a casual knowledge of, yes, that's a violin. But naming Stradivarius and distinguishing that from, from other kind of classic violins, that might be a lot tougher for you and I, even though we can listen to it and hear the difference quite easily. So what is subordinate um, at a level in that vertical dimension is that experience leads to refinement. That's one thing we can definitely say. Secondly, what is a subordinate level object for a non-musician may be a basic level object for a musician. So the, the applicability of this model is going to shift up and down depending on your expertise in a given area. And thirdly then, the more experience that we can bring to bear on an object, subject, the subtler will be the distinction that we can make among different categories within that. Okay, so I'm kind of fleshing out what I mean by what Roche means by the vertical dimensions. But let's look at it from the other perspective. Let's look instead at the horizontal dimension. And within a given category level, some objects are more prototypic than others. Roche, for instance, asked subjects to rate category members according to how good an example they were for a category. Okay. 
And so what you find here is different kind of members can be ranked in different levels of typicality for furniture, which is the, the overriding concept here, the leftmost category in, a, in our, or the, the upper category in our vertical dimension. But if we look at a chair, we can represent that as a much better, chair and sofa, in fact, share rated pleasure for being the most typical thing we think of when you're giving a gen, given a general concept like furniture, okay? They share typicality ratings. Cedar chest, much further down. Stool, a little bit further down, all the way down to telephone, which, yes, is a piece of furniture, but it's about the 60th example we tend to think of in terms of rank ordering. That's a good illustration of furniture, all right? And when we look at the specific score, we find on a seven-point scale when we're representing typicality that, that um, telephone is not chosen as a very typical member of the furniture category. So in essence, if we look at the kind of things that are going on horizontally in the, dimension, in, the, in the dimension that we're building here, what Roche finds is that, that as you'd, you'd expect, several different things turn out to be true. And that is that those that are more prototypical share more attributes in common than do atypical category members. Okay, so if we spell out the, the dimension horizontally, um, those that are more prototypical share more attributes in common. Secondly, Prototypicality means fewer shared features with others. So if you're a good prototype for a given element, a given word, you tend to share fewer attributes for good examples of another kind of word. In other words, there'd be confusion among categories if we didn't have this ability to separate them out along the, the horizontal dimension. And so in essence, prototypic category members are most representative of their own category and least representative of other categories. In other words, a strong category member has a good family resemblance if it is a good example of a category and a poor family resemblance if it is a poor illustration or example of a category. So concepts have what we could call graded structure. We can grade the, the uh, satisfaction of any given concept. Some members of a concept are better examples of a category than are others. And it's also true that the borders of the category are fuzzy. They're unclear when you get to the edge of a given category. Armstrong and Gleitman demonstrated that even well-defined concepts still show prototypicality effects. And this is an interesting way in which you, you see the complexity that you begin to get into when you're actually trying to attach meaning to a given object or find it in the array of storage that we're gonna build toward in memory here. For instance, an odd number has no fuzzy border at all. I mean, we can define an odd number very specifically. And yet, if you look at that, three is a better odd number than is 501. And yet, you know, I can name any number and you can instantly tell me it's an odd number, it's an even number. And yet it turns out that if we rate the prototypicality of, of four, that's much more satisfying to us than is 106. God knows the rating that 3,456,789 would have attached to it, and yet it's an, odd, it's, it's an odd number. There's no debate about that. But even when we define something very precisely, there's leakage around the edge. That's the problem that we're facing here. So a concept with a clear border can still have members that are good and less good representatives of that category. Prototype effects are very general. And then I'm gonna throw another wrinkle, another wrench in, in your understanding here. And that is think about ad hoc categories. I just loved this article when I found it a number of years ago, but he raises, Barcelou raises a very interesting point. Let's suppose your house catches fire. What objects are you gonna save? That's an example of an ad hoc category. You'd never thought of it, or maybe you had in, in uh, careful planning. But in essence, which ones are you gonna save? That creates an ad hoc category. If you had an accident, which was not your fault, in which your car was totaled, what car would you buy as a replacement? Since the funds are paid for by your insurance and you're probably gonna have more funds available for yourself than you would if you'd simply taken that wreck of yours in and tried to trade it in on something else. The actual book value, unless you've been a stellar car keeper, are a lot higher when it's totaled. 
than when you just take it in and innocently try to trade it in. So that creates essentially an ad hoc category, and we're going to define that for you as essentially a specialized classification invented in response to a particular occasion, the fire in your house or the wreck that you've had. They do not exist in your memory before they're created and used. These categories emerge as a uniquely created demand state of your memory, essentially. Current context generates a unique state in which an ad hoc category is possible. You can identify what to save from your house, though you may never have thought about it before. You don't have any particular problem deciding what you need to save, the checkbook and so forth and so on. You can identify what to save in that situation. Members may have no attributes in common in that situation, and yet they're part of a category. Your checkbook and your car keys are pretty different from one another, and yet you're going to want to salvage both of those in the case of, of your house suddenly being on fire. So essentially, what, what Barcelo did, I'm going to skim this, but, but basically what, what he was able to demonstrate was that, that we can create instantaneous categories, as happens when your house catches fire or you have an accident. And the main determiner simply seems to be the, the, the specific exemplar's adequacy to the particular task. For instance, what do you want to do to save yourself from being killed from, by the mafia? And there are a series of things that we go through, and what, what decides that that's a good representative is essentially how adequate is it to the category name that's, that's been satisfied. So we can cl cross-classify -class um, concepts both in its basic level and any of the others, but we still tie it back to, um, well, essentially what we're dealing with there is creativity. If you take a given concept and try to, you know, you might think it's, it's somebody in discussing with you what do you say when your house catches on fire is creative. If they nail something dead on that you think, of course, I need to save that. And that, so really what, what, what makes a member um, a, a good member of, of a given category is its adequacy to the overall label that's involved there. Perceiving these new general uh, organizations may be necessary to achieving new goals or approaching ones that, in novel ways. Uh, but the basic idea of that ad hoc category is kind of an intriguing one because it, it really, anything can fit when your house is burning. But let's look at that and lead the, from there into yet another way to organize our memory. And that is with semantic networks. It represents essentially a web of interconnected elements that are called nodes. And we're going to use certain principles to, to uh, talk about specifically nodes, which are an element which represents a concept within a semantic network. Nodes are linked to other nodes in that network. And the internodal connection represent essentially labeled relationships. Okay, so the, the links between nodes are essentially um, defining what is meant by category membership. Okay. A cow is a mammal, which is an attribute, okay? Connecting warm-blooded animals, mammals, to other mammals. Other meaning-based relationships may develop out of these nodes, but the precise form of the network differs from model to model. There are several different models of networks that have been developed. One of the classics still referenced today was developed originally by um, Collins and Quillian. In 1969, they proposed a hierarchical model of semantic information. And to show you how important the, the limits on that model are, I want you to get ready. And you need to pay attention here because I'm going to show you something visually. A hierarchical model would permit this. All right? And in fact, what I want you to get ready for is the fact that a word is about to be pronounced and appear on the screen, and it's going to appear right here. And I want you to vote. Have you seen or heard this word before? Left hand is a, an indication of yes, you've seen or heard it before, and you need to have both hands free to vote here in just a second. Even at home, I want you to do it because the reaction time is what I'm driving toward here. Okay? Are you ready? Mafterling. Left hand means yes, right hand means no. no. Now what's intriguing about that particular illustration, and I've, I've gone to an awful lot of, of uh, pain to create this for you, but if you think about that, when I used a word like mafterling, you couldn't just say no 
you had to scan through the entirety of your vocabulary. If you think about it, because Mafterling was a word that you had not previously seen or heard, that puts some real limits on any kind of storage mechanism that we're going to do, whether we, whether we use a semantic network or prototypes or any of the other of several models that are talked about in, in, um, in the Matlin text. But in essence, what you've got to do is to keep that demonstration in mind, because it means that you have essentially performed an exhaustive search of your memory. And right now, you'd be willing to bet breakfast or lunch or supper money, depending on when you're viewing the lecture on the fact that you're darn right. No, I've never seen Mafterling before. I haven't seen it. I haven't heard it. What that means is that you had to perform an exhaustive search of your memory, an exhaustive search. You had to have some kind of a way to lop off large numbers of models and not even examine them. And what that also implies to us then is that we've got to have a branching model. You've got to be able to, to take m and go into the, the storage unit in some way and quite confidently not even examine a large number of the words stored in your vocabulary. I really love that Mafterling demonstration because it really poses a lot of very specific rules that our model is going to have to be able to match in order to allow you to as rapidly as you did go through um, finding out that, that um, you didn't know that word. So uh, Ebbinghaus originally had a, a um, uh, a model that was based on associations. And the model involved units, um, basically that would, would, um, would in, well, in fact, let me, let me, before I get into that, let me, let me uh, go through one other slide for you. And that is, boy, I hope things aren't messed up in terms of what I'm trying to illustrate here. But let me show you specifically what's involved in trying to sort through your memory very efficiently. One idea is to use sounds. So we just take the first sounds of the word that I posed to you, mafterling, as you would have pronounced it if you'd seen it, and we can dig down through the, the sounds, sound-wise, go down to M, and there, there are a lot of different possible candidates. Massachusetts, match, maverick, monkey, mother, and a whole bunch of others. So let's cycle back in. We've got M under M, let's look at A. And in that case, we've narrowed down the candidates to Massachusetts, match, maverick, Okay, we'll go back in again. Whoops, it's heading the wrong direction here. I seem to be mashing buttons the wrong way. We'll go back into ah. And when we get that far, we've only had to go to three sounds. We've only got one possible candidate remaining. And that is you would shape your mouth the same way, whether you said maverick or mafterling. But in fact, we've already reached no. But just to double check, let's go back and check the t sound. And so in this case, there are simply no words there. So you actually, in scanning your entire memory in a branching program, only had to reach three decisions. Okay? Because v is vocalized where f is not. Your mouth is shaped the same way. But the sound that's produced is different with mafterling than it is with maverick. So you really only had to make three decisions, and just as a double check, you might have gone in and, and looked at the, uh, the t sound in addition. But in essence, what that does is to put some very serious limits on what we're going to have to be able to use. So we're going to have to, to uh, another possibility is, is to essentially propose a, a model that's based on, on meaning, which would be another possibility. And that puts us into several different interesting network models, OK? So in this case, um, we can have much more rapid reaction time to individual words, as we recall them, if we do it by meaning. So for instance, if you take a word like animal, that has a number of different features. Animals themselves share in common the fact that they have skin, they can move around, they eat, and they breathe. All of those are true of any animals. But in fact, among those animals, there are certain things like birds, which actually have categories, things that are related to birds, that are not true of all animals. Birds, as we discussed earlier, have wings, they can fly, and typically they also have feathers. Not always, but typically. And in turn, if we categorize a bird as a canary, I should say, as a bird, interestingly enough, if you think about canary, yes, it's a bird, yes, it's an animal. But actually, there are only two features to canaries that are uniquely true of canaries and only canaries. That is, they can sing and they're yellow. Beyond that, any other feature you want to add to a canary 
is a feature at least of its birdness and or its animalness. Okay? An ostrich is also a bird, as we've defined earlier, but it has a very different set of unique features that are unique to it. It has long, thin legs. Well, a canary would look pretty funny with long, thin legs if it were yellow and could sing. So, in fact, we've got a separate set of attributes that we attribute to ostriches. They're tall, and as it turns out, they can't fly. But that's a different category of, of birds. If we back up in the model, it turns out we can also measure fish. Okay? And in that case, under fish, we've got things that have fins, they can swim, and they have gills. An attribute specifically of fish includes sharks. There are only two features that are actually uniquely true to sharks, and that is they can bite and they're dangerous. Beyond that, there are a lot of other fish that would qualify. And when we look at salmon, a very different kind of fish, they're pink, they're edible, and they swim upstream a long distance, very specifically to lay their eggs. So this is a, an example of, of a network model um, that can be utilized here. You notice that there's more rapid reaction time. Well, in fact, let me show you the data that can be generated out of this network model. And the research that's been done here is really quite specific, okay? The units that are involved in a, that we're going to be talking about here apply to things like canaries and ostriches. At the next level up, we have properties, okay, of the more general category. And even above that, we have pointers, things that are specifically true of animals. So we can, we can in the network, we can talk about the units themselves, whether it's canaries, ostriches, sharks, salmon, you name it. We can talk about properties applying to those, and that applies to the more generic label like bird or fish, and in turn pointers are associations among the units and the properties. So a pointer is something that links a particular element, a property, of the, the broader unit that we're talking about there. And what we would predict then is that sentences will take longer to process as they involve one or two or three labels of le levels of, of processing. Let me show you what I'm talking about. The original experiments that were involved with this, this network model of, of how words are, are uh, stored essentially involves the following kind of reaction time. I might have, for instance, put you in a true-false thing where I feed you a sentence like, a canary is a canary, and I ask you to tell me yes or no, reaction time as rapidly as you can. And when we do that, we find that, that simply reading on a computer screen a word like, or a sentence like, a canary is a canary, takes about a second. It's just about a second to process that and react correctly. Yes, that's true. Okay. A canary is a bird? Well, yeah, you've got to delve down into the, the network model to, to find canary and then see what it's a category of. It's, it's a division of bird. So a canary is a bird adds about a quarter second of processing time, but it still works. We can answer correctly, a canary is a bird. So when you put subjects into a, a computer system where you're posing sentences like this to them in a reaction time mode, you're going to have an equal mix of true and false. A canary is a snake. Well, that's no. But if we're plotting only words that involve a canary is a canary and then a canary is a bird, animal, or sentences that are true in that form, um, the reaction time is about 1.25 seconds. And if we jump it to the next level, a statement like a canary is an animal, lo and behold, we add about another five hundredths of a second to it, and it gets up to about 1.3. But look at what happens here if we mix it, if in fact we add yet another level. We're now going to look at an attribute of canaries as we talked about it earlier. And the reaction time is still true, still consistent, and that is that a canary is, a, is an animal, takes about 1.3 seconds on average to confirm as being true. But if we ask a specific feature, a particular property of canaries, um, the pointer in this case now is going to suggest that when we're looking for a feature within canariness, a canary can sing takes about 1.3 seconds in order to answer correctly. A canary can bark, well, we go down from animal to canary or, or to bird to canary and find no, one of the attributes of birdness is, is, not, fly, uh, is not barking. And so in that case, 
A canary can fly to confirm that is true takes about 1.4 seconds. If you think back to the semantic model that I was showing you originally there, what we've got to do is link from animal to bird, from bird to canary, and then we have to go back up and link a feature of canaries which involves not just canaries but other animals. So the fact is stored in a different place. And the reaction time takes longer. We're up to about 1.4 seconds to answer statements or to react correctly to statements like a canary can fly. And in fact, to stretch the model even further, if I give you a sentence like a, a canary has skin, which you'll remember is an attribute of everything called an animal, you've now got to link it across two levels. You've got to go into animals, to birds, to canary, and then back through canary to animal to find the feature of, of uh, animals, which is skin. So this model, yes, is correlational. But the consistency of the data suggests that we may really be on to something when we start trying to, to pose a, a, a model, retrieve words, based on the meaning of the, of the individual word and how those facts are stored within memory. Okay, a canary can sing, a canary can fly, and a canary has skin. But we've added a tenth of a second going from singingness to flyingness to skinness. The data is remarkably consistent. In terms, of what, in terms of what Collins and Quillian originally proposed in that network model. And that consistency is one of the reasons that model has stuck around for a long time. One of the things that this model cannot account for is what is called a typicality effect, okay? It takes longer to verify that a chimp is a primate than it takes to verify that a chimp is an animal. That's a problem for this network model, okay? A chimp is a chimp as we showed you earlier, is, is a fairly simple reaction. A chimp is an animal also turns out to be simple, and surprisingly enough, in terms of this model, it takes longer to confirm that a chimp is a primate than it takes to confirm that a chimp is an animal. That's a problem for the semantic model as we organized it, okay? With the most general label having under it the various kinds of, of features that it, it may actually relate to. That's a, a what is called a typicality effect. And that leads us in turn into getting a little ahead of what I was talking about, but it's easier to verify that a canary is a bird than it is to verify that an ostrich is a bird. We wouldn't predict that from our model. Both are at one level from bird. So the difference in reaction time is not predicted by this particular model. But that in turn leads us to another kind of model, another way to organize words, these reaction time data, lead us into another kind of situation. And that is what's called a spreading activation effect. Let me show you on the screen what I mean here. And that is, if we take a concept like red, it's obviously part of, of human memory but it differs from the hierarchical model, this, this spreading activation model, in the following kind of a way. Red is closely related to other colors. Okay, if we look at the, the, um, the, the um, relationship among the, among the models here, um, we, can, we can in fact show by reaction time that red is related to green, we know it's related to orange, we know it's less directly related to yellow because red and orange are closer to each other and red and yellow are closer to each other than red and green. But in terms of the spreading activation model, what is going to be proposed here is that all the other things that we know about red in fact relate to things like fire engines and in turn, if you look at the model, to ambulance, to trucks, to buses when we get over to fire engines. So in fact, red is surprisingly less closely related to other things related to red itself, that is, is essentially to red objects. So the tie between red and green is tighter than is the tie between red and fire engine. Because fire engine, in fact, leads us off in the direction of vehicles, for instance, and it begins to dilute our attention. And in fact, still sticking to red as a concept, certainly it relates to one element of fire. Okay? So the, the, the 
the demo is essentially a part of, of showing the way in which our memory can be organized. And let me just talk to that model for a minute while it's on the screen and point out to you several different things. And that is that in terms of this spreading activation idea, the model accounts for the typicality effect because the links that represent the tightness of, of semantic relatedness, for instance, car and bus, is closely related to vehicle. But it's clustered differently than is red to fire engine. Okay? More so than less typical fire engine and ambulance. Fire engine and ambulance are related to each other, but they're more remotely related to red. And so in this case, the, the, uh, the, the less typical link between red and ambulance uh, is explained by the fact that ambulance is more tightly related to a cluster such as fire engine and, and so forth. It doesn't, the concept of red, for instance, does not actively activate the vehicle concept as rapidly as, for instance, words like bus and car, which also turn out to be vehicles, okay? So what we've got is a decline in activation. The spreading activation model assumes that a concept is processed, activation spreads out along the paths of a network, but the efficacy decreases as the activation travels out further. Okay, a decline in activation. I'm going to have to stop the lecture because I'm going into an insulin reaction and I'm getting more and more circular in what I'm saying. So we're gonna simply have to stop. I'll have to pick up about 20 minutes of material related to semantic priming, but I can feel I'm going into an insulin reaction, so I'm simply gonna have to stop. That's the reason things have not been hanging together as well. But there is a really, the spreading activation model really does a very nice job of explaining the, the different reaction time data that were found in, in the initial data that I started with. But we'll lead then into semantic priming and some various other things. I apologize, I've just, I've been doing too much trying to get ready for, for vacation and, and closing out everything later, but we're, we're just going to have to stop at this point. I'm going to have to go get a Coke.